I feel like uh, Vince is a friend. We've met a few times, we've talked several times. Uh, many of you are enjoying his morning devotional from Resolute, it comes at 5.30 every, the mor every morning. Uh, I recommend that, it's free of charge. You can sign up for it today. I have found it to be timely, concise, and powerful. Hmm. It's always scripturally based, and it comes alive, and it seems to come into my day at just the right time. That's one of the many things that Vince will be telling you about. I think another very interesting thing is he was landed yesterday from a trip to Morocco, Lebanon, and other Middle East countries to deliver the same message to men that he's going to deliver to you today. So give him a warm welcome, Vince Miller. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. How you guys doing? Good. Good. There we go. <laughs> Uh, my name is Vince Miller. Uh, Keith, thank you first off for putting this on. I've been to a few of these throughout the area and are you thankful for what this guy has done over the years? Um, there we go. You know, it's always God influencing people, but he's always waiting to use us. You know, he's waiting for us to step in, right? So uh, I think God is always looking for men. He's always waiting for them to make themselves available. And when we do, he does great things in and through us. And that's my hope today is that you'll hear that. Uh, anyway, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, anybody here from the Bay? Yes. One dude in Minnesota. That's always the way it is. There's one dude in a group. Vallejo. Vallejo. Are you serious? I was, I was born in Vallejo. Dead serious. That never happens. Can we have a moment? <laughs> that's unbelievable. Okay, so that never happens, especially. Um, that's chilling. Yeah, Vallejo is the hood. You knew it as the hood, right? So, very difficult place growing up. Uh, my dad was a pretty infamous man in the area. He was a very well-known drug dealer. Yep, no, he was not the Zodiac Killer. That's the only movie people know about California. <laughs> Happened right over the hill from my house, though, I will tell you that. Uh, still not caught that guy. I don't know who he is, but, you know. Um, anyway, so grew up in Vallejo. Um, dad and mom were married. Of course, uh, I wasn't born yet, but I came along a couple years later. And uh, just family life was horrendous. I just did not have a good childhood. Uh, mom and dad got divorced when I was about two. Mom got remarried again, divorced again. Um, but the strange thing is we all lived in Vallejo. We all lived very close to each other. And... Uh, it left me very confused by the time I was 13 as to what it looked like to be just a guy, a man. Uh, the strange part of the equation was that my dad was a pronounced atheist. Uh, he was such an atheist that we weren't allowed to use God's name as a curse word in the house. Think about that for a second. Yeah, seriously, think about that for a second. <laughs> you know you've done that. Yeah, even Christians do this, but... No, my dad, who was an atheist, didn't let us use that name in the house. My mom was an agnostic, so you can imagine how I was raised. So there was no God anywhere in any part of our life. And uh, when I was about 15, my mom came to me one day and said, I'm no longer going to marry. Because she could see that it was affecting me. Uh, her broken relationships were affecting my life. And so she decided it would be a much better idea just to have boyfriends in and out of the house. So over the next few years, there's a lot of boyfriends in and out of the house. And of course, they were miserable. These guys were just a mess. And then one day, my grandfather came over to the house. So my grandfather, Navy dude, bald guy, cool, golfed every day except Thursday, which was Women's Day. And he had a whole slew of reasons to not golf on Thursdays. And he came over to the house, and what was really interesting about this moment was uh, he was a Christian man, and a Christian man had never stepped foot in our house before. So he comes over to the house, he sits down with my mom, and he asks if he can spend time with me. And she caves. She, she says, sure. So no kidding, my grandfather starts spending time with me. He picks me up from school, brings me over to his house in the afternoon after school. We would sit down, we'd have conversations, and then they would fix me a healthy meal, which was some of the first times in my life I've ever had a healthy meal at a dinner table where you talked to each other and you prayed before you started the meal. It was just fascinating. It was a new way of life for me that I had never discovered before, and my grandfather was just influencing me over and over and day by day and gradually over a few years I ended up moving in with him is what happened. 
Uh, my grandfather was a very simple man, a very, very simple guy. Retired, Navy du dude, as I said, golfed every day. He was very predict predictable, but he was a very good teacher around very simple things. You know, he taught me what it looked like to be a man, and what was really strange about this whole thing is I was desperate to understand what that meant. Because around me, there were all sorts of messages about what real manhood looked like. And some of them were hard to discern and hard to understand and hard to define me, for me. But I was looking for direction. And my grandfather was that guy. He taught me all sorts of things throughout my teenage years, like, like how to shave, for example, which I'm still learning how to do. Uh, he taught me things like manners at a table, which I never knew. He taught me stuff like uh, uh, how to pick up women and how to treat them. He taught me stuff like how to drive, and he taught me how to drive, actually, on this vehicle right here. So this is a 1959 Chevy Apache pickup truck. Many of you know this truck? I did super well. This is the car that my grandfather taught me how to drive on. Crazy, right? He bought it brand new off the showroom floor in 1958. He was the only person to ever drive it. Grandmother never touched it. The car had never been scratched or dinged ever in its entire lifetime. It had been painted two different colors by the time I would get it. In the 70s, he had it restored and paid, painted gold with metal flake. <laughs> because that was cool in the 70s, I guess. And then when I was 15, he had it restored to that condition right there. Fire engine red, all chromed out, beautiful oak bed in the back. I mean, it was just cherry beyond belief. Taken, nut and bolt restoration. It was actually taken off the chassis. They completely sanded this thing down, sandblasted it, and even the guys at the body shop said, we have never seen a vehicle without a single ounce of Bondo on it ever. And this is our first. It was pristine. So my grandfather taught me how to drive on this vehicle right here. But here was the premise. He said, if you can learn to navigate Liz, that was her name, Liz, then I will give her to you when you turn 16, which was a big deal for him. I was like, that's, a un that's an unbelievable proposition for that car right there, right? Unbelievable. Classic car, pristine condition. I mean, it was just, it was, a, it was the ultimate vehicle to drive down the road in, right? So that people could stare at you, which is what men do. They like that experience, right? People staring at you to drive down the road. And I, I got to tell you, it was amazing to watch him operate this vehicle. So I studied him very carefully when I knew that he was going to give me this truck. So by the time I turned 15, here I am sitting in this truck and I'm studying my grandfather as he's teaching me very simple things now, but how to navigate this vehicle. So I go and I get my permit, I come home, and after I get my permit and come home, the very first question I asked grandfather was, can I take this truck out for a spin? He said, sure. So we go out for a drive. I hop into it, go out for a drive, and I'm driving downtown, and I make my first stop on a hill. Very first stop on a hill. But remember, it's San Francisco. There's only two ways you're going. You're going up or you're going down. And I happen to stop on a hill going up at a stop sign, put the brakes on, and a woman pulls up right behind me, as close as she can possibly get to the rear of this truck. So I'm there operating this piece of machinery, this big piece of metal, and I do everything that my grandfather has taught me to this point. Put my foot on the clutch, put my foot on the brake, drop the transmission into first gear, three on the tree, move my hand from the shifter to the steering wheel, take my left hand, put it down on the emergency brake, pull up on it, remove my foot from the brake, put it to the gas. You see what I'm doing right here? I'm using every appendage in my body. And if I had another one, I would have used it, right? And no kidding, I'm in this moment and I'm trying to work the gas. Please know I've only taken off from a stop one time in this truck. It was just a few seconds before this moment. <laughs> that was it. I'm down there and I'm working the gas and I'm working this clutch. Now, it's got this big, huge, 
spring-loaded clutch on this vehicle. I mean, it's huge. I mean, you have to be able to squat about 225, 250 to get this thing to go down. And that cushion spot right there, that spring-loaded spot is, it jumps if you don't release it just right. So I'm working the gas and I'm looking up behind me and the woman is still there and I get the engine kind of ramped up a little bit and I get to about 2,000 RPMs, 3,000 RPMs and I'm trying to find the spot and you can tell I'm nervous and I'm shaking. My grandfather sitting in the passenger seat looks over in the side view mirror, sees that there's a woman there and I can see him leaning back, you know? And then he crosses his arms and he turns to me. And he says, son, you better not scratch my truck. <laughs> yep, no kidding, that's what he said. So I start working the gas. And I hit about 4,000 RPMs and about 5,000 RPMs because I am determined to not let this thing roll backwards. And I'm about to find the spot and I'm about to just let it go because it's going to go forward. It is not going to go backwards. And my grandfather yells at me, he says, just stop, stop. And so I kind of rest for a second and I stop and I take my foot off the gas. And, and uh, he said, you know what we used to do when I was kid, a kid, Vince, is back when I was a kid and we were trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this moment, here's what we would do. Just very gently let the truck roll backwards, rest it on the bumper of the person behind us, and then take off. <laughs> and I got to tell you, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, you're crazy. I'm not ever going to do that. <laughs> I want this. This is my truck. I want this truck. I'm going to figure this thing out. And then I was thought to myself, would you stop bothering me? I'm trying to do like 50 things right now. And so I got back in position and I got everything up and I'm ramping up the RPMs again. And I look back and the woman starts to roll backwards a little bit because it's taking a little bit too long. And then I just kind of let it go. And I kind of, I make it, I squeak out of first gear. <laughs> it kind of jerks a little bit, but I make my way around the corner and I felt like I had conquered the world. Seriously, I felt like I conquered the world with my grandfather sitting at my side, teaching me very simple things. I felt like in this moment that I had taken another step toward being a man. You know, my grandfather was a, just a, such a simple guy, but he really invested in me in unique ways, and one way was with this truck right here. Every Saturday for the next six months, he took me out to teach me how to do one thing in Liz, and that was how to parallel park this vehicle. I want you to know there's nothing automatic about this truck, not one thing. Manual, three on the tree, transmission, non-synchro, which means you can't just kind of California roll to these stops. You've, you've got to stop all the way every time you stop. Clutch, totally manual. Right? Starter on the floor. I mean, I had to leave the seat to start this truck. <laughs> Non-adjustable seats. Wing windows. We used to call an air conditioner. <laughs> crank down windows. Yes, with a crank. My son got in a truck a, a, a few years ago. He was 15 at the time. He looks over in the truck and he says, Dad, what's this thing right here? <laughs> I said, well, that's a window crank, son. He says, well, what do you do with it? I say, well, you crank down the window, son. And then he starts rolling the window down like real slowly. And then he looks back at me and he says, Dad, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Why would anybody do this? I mean, how spoiled are we? But nothing on this truck was automatic. I mean, this bus-like steering wheel at a stop, learning to parallel park, was like rowing on a heavy machine with two arms. I mean, you really had to pull on this thing with no power steering on it whatsoever. It was like glued to the pavement, right? But he taught me how to parallel park on this truck. Two months, every Saturday for three hours in flat areas. Two months, every Saturday on inclines for three hours. Two months for three hours on declines. After six months, I hated driving this truck. I didn't even want it. And maybe that was his plan. But I got to tell you, he taught me how to do something that I never had conquered before. He taught me how to parallel park. A few years later, after this moment, my grandfather died. 
My wife, who has never met him, never met him, has met my grandfather hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. Because every time we go out to eat downtown, Minneapolis, St. Paul, I'm looking for a spot on the street. My wife will look at me and she'll say, honey, you cannot get this truck into that spot right there. To which I say, challenge accepted, woman. <laughs> and I promise you, in the 22 years that we've been married, my wife has never not seen me parallel park perfectly the very first time an inch from the curb in any vehicle known to man. I promise you, any vehicle known, it, it just doesn't happen. And she will attest to that. And you know what that is? You know what that is? That's master mentoring. That's all it is. It's master mentoring. Here's what it looks like. It's you taking the time that you have and the skill that God has given you to invest in others. That's it. It's you taking the time that you have and the skill that God has given you and putting that together for maximum impact with other people. You know, my grandfather was so significant in my life that at the age of 20, I made a profession of faith. It took me a while to overcome some of the mentality that my parents had kind of beat into me about the non-fact of God that I kind of had to discover that God was real and I had to learn it on my own. And it was really hard for me to accept the teachings of my grandfather, but he stayed with me in regards to faith. He invested in me. He poured into me. He believed in me. But he taught me not just simple things like this. He taught me the ways of the kingdom of heaven. And because of his influence in my life, I discovered that everything that my mom and dad said about God was true and wasn't. They had built a case against Jesus Christ by saying that the church is corrupt, Christians are fallen and hypocritical, and God is not real. And I came to discover that two of those propositions are true. The church is broken, and we are hypocrites. <laughs> we are. But I came to learn that Jesus Christ was not. Because the kingdom is not built on the church or on you. It is built upon Jesus Christ, who was the fully integrated, all-loving man who wants to extend grace and forgiveness to all people. And I discovered that it changed my life forever. Absolutely changed my life. Radically changed me. And I saw it through this guy right here who taught me very simple things in life and invested in me, invested in me. And I believe he was exactly right about it, that men need other men investing in them for this proposition about the kingdom to continue. And my grandfather died when uh, I was uh, 21. I made a profession of faith at 20, and he died at 21. He got cancer in his spine, and it took his life like almost instantly, it was just hours. My grandmother called me, I was away at college in Oklahoma. My grandmother called me, said you need to come home. I came immediately home. I went into San Francisco International Airport, drove straight to the hospital, and there he was in that bed. I almost didn't recognize him. His skin was hanging off of his bone. His eyes were sunken in, he is yellowed. Uh, he struggled to smile, I could see he was in pain. I walked into the room and almost Seriously, did not recognize him. But as soon as he smiled, I knew it was him. And I walked in and I sat down next to his bed and we had a one hour conversation about life, about decisions, about my beliefs in God, about the future, about his truck. Somehow it was always his truck, but his truck. And then he laid down and I watched him painfully die for the next four hours. Just watched him lay there. And I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's a very humbling, reflective moment to watch a person die in pain. Because you're kind of wondering between each breath and each gasp of air, when's it going to be the last? And you could just kind of, in this ambient moment of noise from his gasping for air, I remember praying out loud to God. It went something like this. God, thank you for this man who invested in my life. If it wasn't for him, I would not know you. And God, for the rest of my life, I want to do for other men what my grandfather did for me, which was mentor me. And then I said out loud in this room with just me and him, but God, would you please replace him to me in my life? Now, that's pretty significant to me. 
Because in this moment, please know this, I was losing the only father I ever had. I mean, me as a guy, as a young kid, I'd always been looking for a father. I'd always been looking for that relationship. And then now finally that I had built this very deep, meaningful, spiritual relationship with a man who had invested in my life, he's being taken from me. So imagine me in this moment feeling fatherless again. Do you, can you sense that? I was feeling fatherless in this moment, and I wanted someone to step into my life. Well, amazingly, after praying that prayer, I went instantly home, instantly home, changed what my study path was from business to Bible, and I just started aggressively pursuing ministry because I knew God wanted to use me to influence guys like you for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. I just knew it. I knew that at the age of 21. But I was longing for the other half of the request to be fulfilled. I was longing for someone to step into my life. And because I'm a fairly disciplined guy and I'm kind of driven, I sought people out on this. Two to five times a year, I went up to guys and said, would you please mentor me? Would you invest in my life? And every time I did that over 20 years, every single time I did it over 20 years, I never found a single person that would take me up on my offer. Seriously, I don't know if God was just bothering me, Keith, or if he was trying to irritate me or what it was, annoy me. But there are many moments in my life I was fairly agitated by this, and there are many moments I was very disappointed. And after 20 years, I assessed the excuses I heard, and there were only two. There were only two over 20 years. It was either... I don't know what to do, or I don't have the time. And you know what? I think God used that to show me the greatest sin of all mankind. So in just a couple of minutes right now, I want to tell you what man's greatest problem is. But I want to do it by backing up to the very beginning of time. At the beginning of time, it says that God created all things, heaven and earth, Animals, creation, light and darkness, all things. The earth and the planets and everything upon them. And then he drops man right into the middle of it. Gender, male, men. That's you. And then what he does is he gives you all dominion and authority and power and says, enjoy my creation. Enjoy it. Take pleasure in it. It is your domain. Do with it what you want. And then God says, name things, define them. As if God is probably entertained by this moment. He watches as man speaks utterances and defines creation by naming it stupid things like giraffe and rhinoceros and, and mouse and rat, cat. Why well, we had to name the cat, I don't know, but you know, cat. And I think God is standing back and he's mildly entertained and has some pleasure about what God is doing. And then God creates the most interesting thing he ever creates right after that. And while you think it's woman, it's not. It's this cavernous gap of space called desire. So anyway, he, he, there's this cavernous gap right there. And, and, and in this moment, we know that God doesn't forget to create woman. He doesn't forget because God knows all things. He knows that man needs woman. He creates something inside of man that's very important. It's this longing and desire for things. I think that's the brewing point for men. This is our ultimate nemesis is our own desire. And in this moment that he's creating desire, God says, well, you have a desire, let me fulfill it, which is the right way for all desires to be fulfilled. And then he creates woman, which is beautiful, right? They're one, they're in the garden, and then in chapter three, only three chapters in, we blow this whole thing, right? One, two, and then three, that's it. And the whole story is ruined here. Here's what happens, woman is in the garden and she's engaging the serpent in a conversation, because that's what women do, they talk, right? She engages, probably not the first time that she's talked to the serpent, right? I know it's strange. Just get over it for a second, okay? It's a talking serpent. You see him on TV all the time. You know, it's like, okay, talking gecko, I get it, okay? So just imagine that. She's talking to the gecko, and she engages in this conversation, and she takes the fruit that she knows she's not supposed to. She brings it back to man. They eat of it. They sin. And the most interesting part of this whole story is the silence of man. I call it apathy. 
That is our greatest problem. Apathy. To do nothing and to say nothing in the face of injustice and sin. Note that. Apathy. To do nothing and to say nothing in the face of injustice and sin when you, man, are empowered with authority, dominion, the ability to find things, and one stinking commandment, not two, one, given all this stuff, you can't speak up and do something when God has called you to doing it, called you to do it. And I believe that's what I discovered over those 20 years is male pattern apathy. And this is our greatest problem. Don't let anybody else say to you in all of your life that there is another greater sin than this one sin. Because Satan loves it when we do nothing. Satan loves it when we say nothing. But when a man speaks up and does something, things happen. Even if they're not right. It doesn't matter. Do it and you will learn something. And if you own a business in the room, you know that's true. Right? Do it and you will learn something. And God might teach you something. But do nothing. And this is the brewing ground for all of sin. Gentlemen, this is our issue. And I believe that this is undermining the Christian movement today. I literally was in Amman, Jordan yesterday. Literally. Before that, I was in Lebanon. Before that... I was in Tanzania. Before that, I was in Morocco, speaking to men just like you, and we have the same problems all over the world. Arab men, Christian men, men just like you, just like me, we all have the same problems, and our sin is that. Apathy. That's it. But if you get a man moving, great things happen. Amazing things. Chilling things. And while the world will want you to be silent, about your beliefs and your convictions, oh, speak up and watch God move. It's chilling. And God's waiting to use you. You know, my grandfather, when he sat in this truck, he didn't just talk to me about driving a truck. That would be lame. He talked to me about life, and girls, mistakes he had made, the future, my mom, my mistakes, challenges that he was facing in the future, finances, good and bad stuff that was happening in politics and the world, all those conversations we had in that little box right there. And all my grandfather did was take a little bit of time and a skill that he had and used it to adjust the barometer of my life. And God showed up in that truck right there. Yet. Too much of the time, I have discovered that men across the world disqualify themselves from the very activity that God has called them to. My grandfather mentored me, and God is calling all people that are called by the name of Christ to mentor others. It was God's only plan, and his original plan was for you to invest your life into other people, to pour it out. I mean, it's crazy, but every one of you sitting in this room has some skill that God has blessed you with. And you have an apportionate amount of, a proportionate amount of time that God has given you as well. And he wants to, you to use that to invest in other people's lives. I mean, you may think to yourself today, ah, I can't do that. You're so wrong. Stop disqualifying yourself. Stop it. Don't ever do that ever again. Because if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you are good enough, gentlemen. You don't have to have all the answers, and you don't need a seminary degree like me, and you don't have to be the greatest leader of any organization like John back there, who's going to speak next time. You need to come hear him and bring other guys to hear him. But you don't need to have, you don't need to have some title after your name to mentor other people. My, my grandfather was an average dude. You might even say below average. He was just an ordinary guy. Nothing special about him. Yet his life invested in me, changed the trajectory of my life forever. And because of him, he has influenced tens or hundreds of thousands of men, just like you. Because I stand in these rooms all the time. Some days, sometimes five times a week I do this because of my grandfather's influence and mentorship in my life. So you've got to stop disqualifying yourself from the very call that God has empowered you to. And if you're sitting in this room and you're a Christian, you are called to open your mouth and to do things that God is requiring of you today, not tomorrow, like now. And God wants you to be propelled into a life of mentorship because that is the way we turn, we turn the tide of Christendom in this country and across the planet is with you men sitting in this room. I mean, are there any plumbers in this room? Any pl There's got to be one plumber. Come on. This is a huge room. One. Okay. There's not. 
All right, I love plumbers. This is good. I can talk about them all day long now. Okay, so I love plumbers. You know why? Because none of you are. <laughs> and everybody knows that a plumbing fix in your house is three trips to the Home Depot. You know that's true. It's one to go get the parts, two to go get the right parts, and three to go get all the rest of the parts that you actually need in the first place. And that takes a lot of time, right? It's exhausting. You got projects that still aren't done, right? I see a guy Larry laughing. You, you got projects that still aren't done and you need a plumber. Stop trying to do it yourself. Go pay someone to do it. So I paid my plumber to come over the other day. His name's Paul the Plumber. I don't think his last name is Plumber. But Paul the Plumber comes over and he comes over. He's a Christian guy and I've got a little pipe that I want sweated on. That's all, and I've tried sweating on stuff and it's horrible. I just cake that stuff on. But I knew if I called Paul to come over and do it, it would take him like five minutes. So Paul comes over. It takes him five minutes to fix that stinking pipe. He charged me $210 for it. $210, it's ridiculous. But Paul's a Christian man that brought his son-in-law with him because he's smart. And me and his son-in-law had about an hour-long conversation about Jesus Christ because his son-in-law does not know Jesus. A little bit of skill, a little bit of time invested in someone else can make a difference in someone's eternity forever and ever and ever. So stop disqualifying yourself. In fact, now that I think about it, I probably should have made, he should have paid me that $210. I was doing all the work. I mean, he just sat sweating on a piece of pipe. But you know what? It's your investment in the kingdom, taking that time that you have to invest in not only the people around you, but the next generation and the generation after that. So that means in this room, if there's any Christian sitting in this room, that you have a calling coming out of this time and place. You have a calling. You have a calling to impact the kingdom for Jesus Christ. And it is not a choice. It is not an option. It's a commandment. Matthew 28, Deuteronomy 6, very clear about it. That everything hinges on your ability to open your voice. I mean, I just met with tens of thousands of Arab men, and they are not silent about their faith at all. Multiple times every day, regardless of what city I was in, I listened to a call to prayer, and people stopped, and shops closed, and people got down on their knees and worshiped and prayed. And I think God wants the same from Christian men. The same kind of conviction, courage, willingness, obedience, challenge. Gentlemen, we can't lose this battle. We can't. Not that we're going to lose it. God ultimately wins in the end, but why don't we have a little fun while we're here? Right? By speaking up and by doing something when God calls us to do it, and I believe the baseline requirement of all Christians is this, is to go mentor somebody. Somebody. Jesus revolutionized the world by doing this. How much time do I got left? Go. Check this out. This is the coolest thing ever. Jesus Christ came to this earth born of a virgin. Super sweet. Don't know exactly how he did it, but it was spoken into existence. There are things that he did here on planet earth that I only wish that I could do. First miracle, Water to wine. Oh, I wish I had that. Oh, I would have some of the closest friends ever. It wasn't even like average wine. It was the best wine. It was gallons of it in jars this tall. It was amazing. Jesus Christ came doing things that we didn't expect of him, right? Just phenomenal things. Heals a leper. Phenomenal. Just in a moment's notice, gets a disabled man up off the floor. Gives a man sight by spitting in the mud and telling him to go wash in a pool. That's crazy stuff, man. I mean, seriously, you're going to spit in the mud and put it on my face? Okay, whatever. Go wash, and his eyes are cleansed. A bleeding woman doesn't even touch him. She touches the edge of his garment, and she's healed. And then after that, he goes to raise a friend from the dead. No, I can't do that, but if I did, people would sure flock to me. But none of these things that Jesus did, I can do. None of them, not one. It's crazy. Except there is one thing that he did do that I can do and all men can do. And it was probably the most genius thing he ever did. 
He consciously chose 12 guys and mentored them. He consciously chose, not accidentally, consciously chose 12 guys and mentored them right at the very beginning of his ministry. And I've reversed engineered it 100 times. It was 22 months he spent with them. That's it. It wasn't eternity. It wasn't forever. It wasn't for the rest of your life. It's not a life sentence for you either. But he mentored these 12 guys. And because he mentors those 12 guys, you sit in this room today. If he doesn't, you never hear about all the great things he did. That is the greatest pyramid marketing scheme of all time. And it is awesome. I mean, look at how many men are sitting in this room today because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. It's crazy. Just look around. You have that kind of impact? Seriously? Well, it's true. My grandfather mentored me. And because of his influence in my life, I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of men just like I'm speaking to you today. It's possible. You want to influence the world for Christ and change politics and business and families and issues like divorce, chaos, lack of integrity, you go mentor one guy. Just one guy. Mentor one guy. And yes, you don't have everything that you need to be able to do that. I understand that. But just go do something with them. Sit down with them. Have a conversation. Invest in their life. Have, pray with them. Challenge them. Hold them accountable. It's amazing what happens when God puts two men together. Lives are changed. Where's Dennis Wolf at? Right there. Dennis Wolf. Where's Fred at? Are you in this room? There he is right here. These guys are leading a group. They're looking for guys to be involved in that group. Right? Am I close? Come sit in their group with them. Dig into God's Word. Have conversations with other men. Because as soon as you put two brothers together in front of the Bible, things start happening. Two men together in front of the Bible changes the world, I believe. It's very simple. It's very simple. Jesus understood it, and so should we. And so I want to invite you into that great journey. Because, gentlemen, we need you. We need you off the bench and into the game of life. And you can be a life-changing person for some guy just like me. And I wanted it. And I was seeking it. And I'm probably going to come ask you for it. A guy just like me. Well, I'm going to give you a gift today. And Keith, you've already mentioned it. Uh, this is one of my newer books. It's called 30 Virtues That Build a Man. And what's in this book is simply this. It's 32-page chapters. Short. 32 page chapters. It uses questions to dig into a text, and that's it. These 30 virtues are 30 conversations that my grandfather had with me in that truck right there. That's all it is. I want to challenge you to do one of two things. It's either this you pick up this book today, and you go invite someone you know into a mentoring relationship. Maybe you need to be mentored. Man, here's your tool to make it happen. You don't have to guess at what the topics are. You don't have to guess at what you're going to talk about. You just grab this book and you go say, will you mentor me? And you find a guy that you want to pull information out of. Some guy who's further along in life than you are. And you invite him into that conversation and just say to him, I want to have five conversations out of this book on great topics that are totally about what it means to be a man. I want to challenge you to do that. There's also guys in this room, and there's a lot of guys like this in this room, that have a little more gray hair on your head. Imagine that. You need to be mentoring somebody. You absolutely need to mentor somebody. You need to grab this book and go pick someone. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go pick them. It could be your son. It could be one of your grandchildren. It could be a neighbor or a friend and say, can we have some conversations out of this book right here? All it is is a few questions and a little bit of Bible text. That's it. And just sit down with them, grab coffee, eat lunch, have a dinner, and invest in their life. And pour it out. Because, gentlemen, you have a lot to give. If you've got some gray hair, you have a lot to give. You really do. You've got wisdom and knowledge and understanding that guys like me, we want. We're craving for it. We're just afraid to ask you. Because we feel like, uh, you don't have the time, or maybe you don't know what to do. 
I'm giving you a resource right here to make that happen. In fact, I want to let you know that right after I wrote this book, the very first person I tried it with was my 17-year-old son. And I opened it up and I said, Grant, I want you to tell me what you think about it. We did the very first chapter. We sat down and I looked at him and I said, what do you think? And he says, oh, Dad, I think guys are going to love that book. And then he said, but, <laughs> I'm waiting for the feedback, right? He says, but, Dad, I'd never heard that story before. And I said, what did you just say? He said, Dad, I'd never heard that story before. And he said, the one you just shared is new to me. And I tell stories all the time. And I came to discover what I had created as a storytelling format for two men to sit down and just one-up each other all day long about the gospel. And it's beautiful, gentlemen. Mentor another man by telling stories of your life with them in a methodical way. So today, guys, you are walking out of this room with this book. If you cannot afford it, it's five bucks. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it. It's five dollars. If you cannot afford it, all I need you to do is write your name and your email on those blue cards and write the word free on it. And then I'm going to be standing right over here and I'll give you a book for your card. That's it. That's all you got to do. Just write your name on the card, fill it out, email legibly your name and put free on it. And I'll give you one of these books because you're not leaving without one of them. This could be that resource that makes a difference in your life. And for some of you, you can't afford it. I'm going to give it to you. If you can't afford it, it's five bucks. Just write your name on your card and your email and hand it to me. And you write the number on there you want. If you want one, you want two, you want three, write it on there. And I'll just exchange you that for some cash if you got it. If you don't have cash, I can send you an electronic bill. It's totally okay. But take a few. Give them out to other guys, people that you know. They're a resource for men to grow in their faith. All right? Also, there's a spot on there for the Men's Daily Devo that you mentioned. I would love to have you sign up for that if you want. If you're looking for a great Men's Devo, I got one of those. But uh, guys, thank you for letting me be here today. But I got to challenge you with this last short 30-second thought. Don't leave this room and do nothing. If you go out of this room and do nothing, you're contributing to the greatest problem of man. It's apathy. Go out of those doors and do something. Something for the kingdom and make a difference. Let's pray. Great God, um, we turn to you today in confession regarding our own apathy. God, there's many moments in life that we have felt convicted but not acted with convicted conviction. Forgive us of our sin. God, I want to pray today that you would empower by the Spirit every man in this room to live with deeper, greater, and more conviction. Because God, you've always been looking for men. You've been looking for guys just like us. We're an army together. And we're better when we act and speak. And so, God, empower us with courage as we leave this room. We pray this in the name of the greatest man who ever lived, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it, bud.